we have our group, it was very short notice, therefore. Yes. Uh, I think the government officials couldn't come, even though they, uh, I shared your report with the you know, Blue House guys mm -hmm. and you know, some other prime minister and etc. but the country didn't think, and also they are preparing for President's you know, Asian plus you know, special summit talk in Busan next week, and they are, they are busy. But I have, however, we have a really wonderful, you know, group uh, you know, journalists, you know, uh, diplomats, and some government officials too. Therefore, I would expect a very you know, productive discussion today. You have five more minutes, more minutes to relax, and then you can give a talk at five fifteen, and then you can give about thirty to forty minutes, you know, PPT presentation. That will be followed by about thirty to forty minutes of you know, discussion. Usually we end, end this meeting around 1.30, but you usually extend into, you know, until up to 2 o'clock. But after that, then you have a, uh, you know, Mr. Lee Jae-hoon, he, he was the editing chief of in Hungary Shimon. Now he's a senior foreign office correspondent at Hungary, but uh, he and uh, one of his junior journalists will be having an you know, interview with you one page into the, in fact, the dialogue between you and me. And, and also with MBN, one of the well respected you know, TV channel in Korea. So that means you're very popular, and uh, you can make uh, some, you know, you know, uh, atomic bomb statement <laughs> thing, so that you can be a uh, you know, <laughs> headlines. Okay, I will move around here so that you can do the presentation. Yeah, you can go ahead. Can I wait for a go? Please go ahead. Okay. This point, moving forward. to move in this side a little bit. Off to the side. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have a Voice of America presence too. Yeah. NPR. Oh, yeah, NPR, sorry. <laughs> I, who is from M Voice of America here? Is it Phil Gallo or something? Oh, yeah, Voice of America signed up for this seminar. I know. But anyhow. Oh, yeah, he sent me a note. I think NPR is more respected than Voice of America. <laughs> <laughs> Great start. <laughs> okay, so thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, for Professor Moon, for uh, hosting this event and the East Asia Foundation. A APLN. A APLN. You know APLN, right? Asia Pacific Leadership Network. For? For? Wait, what? Non-proliferation, nuclear ah. non-proliferation and disarmament. For nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, there we go. The talk I'm giving today is based, the underlying content is based on research I published recently in a report for the Center for a New American Security. The report is already available online. Uh, I'm, I'm going to hit wave tops of, of some of the specific proposals for the sake of time. The report itself had, it details uh, much, much more greatly the actual rationale and the specific step-by-step -step, uh, thinking behind some of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, is this, do I aim this somewhere? Mm. Come on, sir. The right button moving forward. There we go. Okay. So, if this isn't clear enough, <laughs> <laughs> If you, I believe this statement reflects reality. If you can accept this change in narrative, everything I'm about to say today makes a lot of sense. If you resist this change in narrative, if you think this is wrong, if you reject it, you're probably going to contest at least part of what I'm going to say today. So this, what you think about this statement is a good litmus test for what you will think about everything I'm about to say. OK, 
Okay, so this is the argument in, in brief. There's four related propositions. Uh, the overarching statement in its most generic form is that um, arms control as an approach to North Korea is logically in tension with um, the goal of denuclearization, the elimination of North Korea's uh, nuclear and missile capability. Um, related to that, that large sort of broad meta point um, is my contention that denuclearization, the rhetoric of denuclearization actually makes diplomacy significantly harder. Adherence to the goal of denuclearization has become um, a form of uh, what Victor Cha would call and pr promote hawk engagement with North Korea, which is a form of kind of like bad faith diplomacy. Um, and de I want to talk about this a little bit. Denuclearization is not cost free. We all tend to think of it as um, something that's desirable, like a rainbow or world peace or something, and that's fine. But it is, it's neither cost nor risk free. And um, when we grapple with that, and when we accept that, it leads to certain implications for policy, and changes in policy that I'm going to talk about here. Um, this is a bit controversial to say. Actually, everything I'm saying is controversial, to be honest. That's very controversial. I accept that, OK? Uh, I live in New Zealand, so I'm very far away from the artillery shells of Washington. <laughs> I'm out of range. Um, so I'd say 90% of people, experts, technocrats, former policy officials, scholars, who make proposals about how specifically we should negotiate with North Korea. What is the proportional bargaining strategy? What, what transaction do we need to do to convince North Korea to give up nuclear weapons? I think this is mostly well-intentioned. I think it's completely destined to fail. And the fact of North Korea's nuclear weapons now serve as proof of that. Um, and so my goal in this report was to make what I think is like the first ever negotiating proposal on North Korean nuclear weapons that takes seriously the need to make the negotiations credible, which is to say they contribute to, they take into account the requirements of trust building for the sake of security. Um, and so my claim is that we can manage the situation and the, the risks of nuclear instability in Korea better uh, if we're actually more realistic and our starting point is not what is our goal but what is the situation and what is achievable and then working within those constraints um, and that requires bitter medicine for the United States in particular and this is yet another controversial point which is that I believe there is no package or bargain that we can arrange with North Korea. There is no outcome that we can agree to with North Korea um, that leads to an elimination of its nuclear weapons. <coughs> the best that we can achieve is a uh, sort of stable accounting and control and maybe a reduction in North Korea's nuclear capability. And to, to get that relatively modest goal, we're going to have to make significant uh, other people would call them concessions. I would see it largely as just unilateral actions the United States needs to take. Uh, so the United States has the burden of responsibility because it is the great power, because its existence is not at risk in this bargaining process. We know, I'll, I'll talk about this more, but we know a lot about <coughs> the problems of trust building and credibility between strong states and weak states. And the, the burden for making negotiations credible falls on the great power. And the great power, in this case, for 30 years, has not has only cared about North Korean credibility, not our own credibility. OK, so denuclearization 
I think a lot of people think of it as at least cost free. It's, a, it's, it's necessary. Um, it's one of these goals that would serve as a public good in general. And that's a good thing. Everybody thinks, everybody, like, why not pursue denuclearization? Um, it's, it is the conventional wisdom. It is, uh, to a large extent, the consensus in the alliance and in Washington especially. But when we look at what North Korea tells us over time, Choi sung hee KCNA, Wego, the foreign ministry in North Korea, Kim Jong-un himself, repeatedly, this is just a sampling of some of the things North Korea has said since 2016, their nuclear weapons are essential to their survival. They rectify an imbalance of power with the United States. We know this. Everybody knows this. So why would they abandon that insurance, right? Um, and in that context, denuclearization is the unilateral disarmament of North Korea. Why would North Korea accept that goal? That's a problem. That means that our well-intentioned aim of denuclearization is complete, it is itself a threat to North Korea. North Korea rejects that goal. We see this in North Korea's word and deed. But generally speaking, we ignore it because we like our, our rainbow goal, our utopian goal. We feel better about ourselves, that like we have moral superiority if we uh, pretend that we can all just pursue North Korean denuclearization and Steve Began might save us. No. So this is, should be very familiar to everybody. Everybody knows why we want North Korean denuclearization, right? If North Korean nukes hold US allies at risk, now it holds US territory at risk of strike. Um, because North Korea can hold US territory at risk of strike, there is the possibility of decoupling the United States from the protection of allies. Uh, there's concern about the global nuclear non-proliferation regime, right? The nuclear tab, the global nuclear taboo, um, and there's a concern also about, frankly, if North Korea has nuclear weapons as an actor, sort of outside of the norm of the international system, that they will traffic proliferating nuclear weapons to other countries. Um, it's not so crazy. We saw them try it in Syria in the early 2000s. So all of these reasons are sensible reasons for wanting to disarm North Korea. But it's also sensible to want world peace. It's also sensible to want global zero and the elimination of nuclear weapons. That's, that's not what matters. What matters is what's your theory for how you are going to get rid of these nuclear weapons or achieve this quixotic goal through policy. And when you take a quixotic goal and you make it the concrete objective of policy, you end up distorting your policy in pursuit of something that cannot be achieved. And so the costs and risks of what you're doing, why would that make sense if the goal is not achievable? So um, we have clearly, We've clearly failed so far to denuclearize North Korea. This is not a big surprise. Um, and this, this just is a statement of why we would want to get rid of North Korean nukes. And I, I, I don't disagree with this. Like, so I was in the Obama administration. I was implementing, making North Korea policy. I was part of the system that was reifying and reinforcing all these things. And you do the performative. Ah, uh, yes, denuclearization, six-party talks, let's go back to six-party talks, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the end result was a nuclear-capable ICBM. So, if what matters is how you go about your goal, what you do for policy, we should consider how North Korea responded to that. When we look at all the missile tests that North Korea conducted, basically in its history, you start to see clustering in three specific areas of the timeline. Those three areas of the timeline just so happen, actually not just so happen, those three areas of the timeline are the periods where the United States pursued 
the most significant pressure on North Korea. These were periods of U.S. coercion, of mutual enmity between the U.S. and North Korea. Um, and the more the United States ratcheted pressure, the more North Korea tested missiles. And testing missiles is the most direct way to improve its nuclear and missile capability. So the approach that the United States has taken for the past 30 years has helped get us to this very dismal, bleak point that we've reached now. I'm going to come back to why this matters, if it's not obvious. And so when we say that we want to maintain the goal of denuclearization, even though 100% of policy officials that we talk to will acknowledge that, uh, yeah, so no, 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 we don't expect North Korea to give up nuclear weapons, but we're going to keep saying that's the goal. At the top of our information memos to our negotiators and our senior leaders, when we have our negotiations, when we formulate policy internally, that top line goal of the objective of the administration, in every administration, it's still going to say the goal is denuclearization. And then those policymakers in every presidency have to come up with policy measures that plausibly move them toward the goal of denuclearization. And that's why it matters so much that we established up front that North Korea is not going to give up nukes. That the goal is quixotic. It is unrealizable. It is unrealistic. Because it means the United States has to keep taking greater risk to achieve the, what is an increasingly ambitious end state goal. And that's what we see when we look at this here. It's when the U.S. feels like the situation is more acute, needs to resolve the new, needs to stop North Korea from hitting a certain level of progress, like the KN08 or like an ICBM, um, that, North, that the United States ratchets up the pressure on North Korea. But the result is this. The result is more missile testing. The result is a greater capability. <coughs> so how long can we do the same thing and expect a different result? My God. So this is, uh, in, and I spend more time in the report talking about this, but this is precisely why um, holding to the goal of denuclearization is neither cost nor risk free. It is the goal of denuclearization that justified the maximum pressure campaign in 2017, and of course maximum pressure was the proximate cause of the crisis, right? From the U.S. perspective, the worst since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And without the judgment that Kim Jong-un could not be trusted with nuclear weapons, the United States would not have been able to pursue this path to bloody nose, path to conflict, to prepare for war, to make these bombastic threats of war. All of that was only justifiable within a frame of reference where we had to stop Kim Jong-un from getting nuclear weapons. That's the only way you can rationalize all of that crisis inducing activity. So denuclearization itself, and I wrote a book about this in 2018 called On the Brink, uh, available in bookstores now. And that book documents in pretty fine-grained detail how denuclearization itself fueled this crisis. It wasn't the only factor, right? But if you were able to change this goal to something more modest, all that maximum pressure, fire and fury, all that stuff would have been unjustifiable. And so the risk of crisis stability, the risk of crisis instability in Korea is elevated because of enhanced U.S. risk taking when the paradigm is denuclearization and because of what I showed you with the, the missile testing trajectory, right? North Korea responds to pressure with pressure. This is empirically demonstrated over time. It's almost impossible to argue against it, although maybe somebody will. Uh, North Korea responds to pressure with pressure. And more pressure is the only path to denuclearization in Washington's mind. This is bigger than Trump. Um, and then this, this, this notion of poison pill for diplomacy, or hawk engagement, right? The idea that you, you go through the, the theater of diplomacy, the actions of diplomacy, you use the rhetoric of like being pro-engagement, 
but you structure diplomacy in such a way that uh, the odds of achieving a positive outcome are close to zero. Right? Most, uh, if there are any diplomats in the room, you'll probably have a problem with me saying this, but uh, most diplomatic negotiations are predestined to succeed or fail before they even start based on the structural constraints of the situation. It's the job of the diplomats to figure out, given all of these constraints that we have and that the other side has, is there a win set? Is there a mutually acceptable outcome given all these constraints, right? It's not that you're trying to create magical outcomes on your own, untethered to reality. And so the job for diplomacy becomes harder and harder depending on what those background constraints are. And so denuclearization, as much as it seems like a positive thing, it is again the unilateral disarmament of Kim Jong-un. If you want to achieve only, like, we talk to most Washington policymakers, they want to um, just go after a small deal, some sort of mutually acceptable bargain. It's going to be well short of denuclearization, but they also want to hold on to the rhetoric and goal of denuclearization. That's the best case scenario that we could, we could hope for. It's the best case scenario that Washington hopes for. And it's sort of always been that way. Uh, even in that best case scenario where you achieve some small uh, progressive deal with North Korea, you're telling Kim Jong-un that is a baby step toward his unilateral disarmament. That makes the whole thing disingenuous from North Korea's perspective. Why? You're creating incentives for Kim Jong-un to renege or to come off of the commitment or to not fulfill any bargain that is reached at the negotiating table. Why would Kim Jong-un agree to take small steps that lead to his eventual disarmament? If we tell him, and if we tell the world, that these small steps are supposed to lead to him giving up nuclear weapons, what incentive does he have to do that? Again, that's why that initial judgment about whether North Korea could foreseeably give up nuclear weapons matters so much. And I think any reasonable person thinks the answer is like, no, they're not going to do that. So this is just um, the reasoning that supports my claim of why denuclearization is neither cost nor risk free. And my contention partly is that the whole nuclear crisis itself and the risk of war in 2017, that emerged from the fact of denuclearization as a goal itself. So um, if not denuclearization, why not arms control, right? Um, I've been promoting some version of an arms control argument since uh, I left government in 2014, and there have been three major arguments against pursuing arms control with North Korea. Um, the first is the moral hazard problem, or more specifically, that engaging North Korea in arms control, the way that the US has engaged China and the Soviet Union in arms control elevates North Korea's international status. So it's the argument against granting North Korea status because then it's kind of like rewarding North Korea for bad behavior, right? Uh, but then we saw with, that is one of the um, perverse silver linings of the summits, right? The summits were with Trump and Kim Jong-un were total failures um, and that is to be expected. I predicted as much. Probably. But um, Trump said, coming out of the first summit, that he he was asked about this status question, like you're normalizing Kim Jong Un internationally, like you're making you're laundering his reputation, um, you're making him a world leader like any other, basically. And he said, yeah, good. I hope I gave him credibility. I want to give him credibility. It's a quote in my book. Uh, so. There is no greater symbolic status granting that the United States could give to North Korea than a presidential summit, than multiple presidential summits. So this argument, there was some merit to it maybe before 2017, but ever since the summits, if you, if you supported the summits, you can't make this argument. That's insane, right? Um, having an arms control 
negotiation with North Korea is not going to grant North Korea more status than summits with the U.S. president. <coughs> so the second argument against arms control is that North Korea cannot be trusted to implement its agreements. And actually, the U.S. and North Korea have a very poor track record of implementing agreements that we've reached, right? Um, there's, there's a lot of partisan debate about who's at fault there. Um, I think we're both at fault, frankly. But it's understandable that you would be worried about North Korea not living up to its commitments. It will not fulfill whatever agreement it reaches under an arms control regime. Maybe so, but this is not an argument against arms control. This is an argument against negotiating with North Korea at all. If North Korea cannot be trusted to implement an arms control agreement, it also cannot be trusted to fulfill a denuclearization agreement or any other kind of agreement, right? So this is not an argument against arms control. It's an argument against basically dealing with North Korea, just period. And then third, um, even if arms control is successful, and even if uh, you know, the US government end up, ends up doing everything I'm recommending here, North Korea will still be able to hold US allies at risk, US territory at risk, possibly, of attack. Uh, and this is true, but the, the threat that North Korea can pose to allies in an arms control regime has to be compared to the threat it would pose right now under a status quo trajectory. What kind of threat will North Korea pose if you have no agreement with them? If they're able to continue developing their nuclear and missile capability unrestrained as they effectively have been able to do for the past X number of years, right? Um, since 2011, 2012 at least. And so it is true that under an arms control regime, North Korea will be able to still um, attack U.S. allies. But North Korea's ability to credibly threaten U.S. allies will be marginally less than it is now, marginally less than the status quo trajectory based on right now. And we, we, we need to remind ourselves, because we never do, that there's no such thing as absolute security. The pursuit of absolute security is how you end up doing stupid shit, sorry, like invading Iraq, right? It's the pursuit of absolute security that makes you do dumb stuff. That's what, that's what justifies bloody noses, for example. Um, and so if there can be no absolute security, then an arms control regime makes a lot more sense. And so my, uh, I scream it from the mountaintop. My argument for so long now is that, look, North Korea is a nuclear state. We can have a debate about like granting them the status of a nuclear state. We can have a debate about uh, how this relates to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT. But this needs, for, for the purpose of policy planning by South Korea and the US, this needs to be the goal, not denuclearization, but the thing that matters most. The thing, this is the main purpose that the alliance itself should serve now. Right? We've got to reduce the risk of nuclear war. What, what goal could be more important than that? And this was not even a consideration in US policy in 2017. And that's how we big fat ended up in a crisis. When this is everything that you aim your policies toward, the content of your policies look very different from how they've looked for the past, whatever, 30 years, 20 years. And so uh, this is a snapshot of the blueprint that I proposed in the, the report for how to engage in an arms control regime, a credible arms <coughs> control regime with North Korea. One that stands a real chance of North Korea actually uh, adhering to fulfilling on its side of the, its side of the bargain. Um, and there are uh, a number of initiatives here. I don't, for the sake of time, I can't walk through each one. I want to hit a couple highlights. And I want to point out one thing that is crucial. 
which is that for 30 years, when U.S. policymakers, South Korean policymakers too, mostly North, uh, U.S. policymakers, when they engage in diplomacy with North Korea, they skip the column on the left, and they jump straight to phase one or phase two. And that completely ignores what it takes to establish credible commitments. That completely undermines the ability for diplomats to achieve and implement something real with North Korea, given our mutual adversarial status. And so keeping the credibility of negotiations in mind, there is a lot that needs to happen that the U.S. needs to do. It's the Americans' burden in order to show that this is not just transactional. Because transactionalism will never, never, never achieve denuclearization. It will never stabilize the situation long term. If it's transactionalism between enemies, you know, Koreans are damn good negotiators. Right? <laughs> and North Korea has proved that they're damn good negotiators. So we need to broaden how we do this so that it's not transactional, it's about tr tr transforming the larger context within which transactions occur. Um, and so these unilateral actions that I propose, if you do just one of them or two of them or something, it is not going to change the situation. It's not going to change the context within which negotiations happen. And that's the problem with these, this little tit-for-tat stuff like we're doing now. So like Secretary of Defense Mark Esper comes to Korea, says we're going to suspend military exercises. Oh, woohoo! In the name of diplomacy. That's so thoughtless in the sense that it's untethered to any like strategy. Suspending exercises could, could achieve something in a wildly different context. But when you make one minor move on the board by itself in isolation, the execution of one small tactic is not going to achieve some big strategic goal. That's idiocy. That's insanity. So there are scenarios where you could do stuff like suspending military exercises, but it has to be structured strategically, in sequence, in the context of other moves that collectively signal something, that credibly signal something. If it's just an isolated move, uh, we do this one little thing. We move our pawn on the board, one move. What is that going to change? Why would North, oh, that's going to get North Korea's nuclear weapons out of, out of North Korea. Get out of here. So um, what I'm proposing is that over a period of time, presumably after Trump leaves, but um, it could start now, we need to stop emphasizing the rhetoric of denuclearization. It would be helpful if um, the bureaucracy and the president, not one or the other, we need both in this era, uh, would say that, like, look, denuclearization is no longer a serious goal of U.S. policy. Um, it's something we very much want. It's a vision. It's an. It's a long-term ambition. We're not orienting our policy toward that end. We're orienting our policy policy towards nuclear stability in Korea. Why? Because we want to reduce the risk of nuclear war. Uh, and North Korea already has nukes, and we're not blind. We see that. Um, in the early Cold War period, it was thought that um, the U.S. and the Soviet Union could not peacefully coexist, right? And that, that notion animated a lot of aggressive Soviet policies. And it was only after uh, Nikita Khrushchev decided um, in the early, mid-1950s that the Soviets could coexist with, with U.S.-led capitalism. It was only at that point that foreign policy initiatives within the Soviet Union had justifications for restraint. And I think something along those lines could work here, but in the opposite way. If we can, instead of H.R. McMaster, the old national security advisor under Trump, instead of him saying, you know what, we can't live with a nuclear North Korea, we can't trust Kim Jong-un with, with nuclear weapons. If we said instead, look, you know, as long as you're not actively threatening our allies, there is, a, there is very clearly a future where we can peacefully coexist with North Korea. And we establish, we, we establish that loudly and proudly. Because we'll, we've already acknowledged some version of that. But just making it explicit, right? 
Uh, changing the rhetoric and the narrative around the negotiations makes a big difference. Um, and in that vein, so that's like cheap talk stuff, right? It's symbolic. And so what's, where's, the, where's the beef, as they say? Like what is the more costly stuff that the U.S. Uh, might need to do to change the context? <coughs> we do need to have broad, broad spectrum engagement with North Korea, which is to say when we engage in track one and track 1.5 dialogues with North Korea, it can't just be narrowly in the foreign ministry channel. Again, this is controversial. Uh, the foreign ministry is only one interest group or bureaucratic actor in North Korea. Within their own national security system, there are all these other stakeholders. And Kim Jong-un's the man on top, right? But he doesn't decide everything, and he certainly doesn't implement everything. There are lots of functionaries with lots of different provable preferences for different policies. So um, what the United States has done with China for a while now is they've had track 1.5 negotiations, not negotiations, dialogue that's been institutionalized. It's called a strategic stability dialogue. And it, it helps create stability, nuclear stability in the China-US relationship. And what it does is it takes national security experts from China, from the US, current officials, former officials, it's track 1.5, and they compare understandings of deterrence, military doctrine, nuclear doctrine, misperceptions. Each side gets a chance to explain the intentions behind different signals, different goals, right? Uh, it's a huge, it's, a, it's this low cost, no cost initiative that the U.S. has used for years to stabilize the nuclear relationship with China, to reduce misunderstandings and miscalculations, <coughs> and to engage actors in diplomacy in the Chinese system outside of the foreign ministry channels, to make other actors in Chinese national security system stakeholders in various forms of engagement with the U.S. So there are all these benefits at like no cost, cost of, of holding meetings, right? Um, that we use in the China relationship, and I think we can and must do something similar with North Korea. And that requires engaging um, the KPA, the military, it requires engaging the National Defense Commission, um, and that is obviously very controversial. I've said the word controversy like 20 times today. But what's the downside? And when internally, you have different stakeholders in the North Korean systems advocate, in system advocating for different kinds of policies, would it not be desirable for a KPA general or members of the National Defense Commission to think about their upcoming meetings with U.S. nuclear experts? Or uh, if they're aware of our sensitivities to certain kind of moves or how we perceive their moves, would, would, and, then they make, and then North Korea makes decisions within that context, wouldn't that benefit everybody? Wouldn't that make the situation inherently more stable and reduce risks of miscalculation? Why would we not want that? Uh, and also there's this huge gap of information that we just don't have about North Korean nuclear doctrine, about how North Korea thinks about its nuclear weapons. People like me, people like Ian Pinkston, we make inferences about North Korean nuclear strategy. We don't know anything, really. And to be honest, neither does the North Korean Foreign Ministry. No offense. Um, and so we need to engage actors who are involved in nuclear strategy actively. Not just their negotiating strategy, but their nuclear strategy. And that's their defense establishment. We need engagement with them, too. Um, and then... And then, yes, uh, I do think we need to declare an end to the Korean War. Uh, that's, it's, it's a small thing and a big thing at the same time. It's small in the sense that it costs nothing. It's big in the sense that it needs to come in parallel with um, the sort of like longer, bigger rationale for U.S. troop presence in Korea, right? Uh, but that's reasonable to do. And frankly, the Korean War ended a long time ago. And so there are reasons to keep troops in Korea. There are reasons to debate it. Let's debate that and not just concretely link the future of US troops
to a war that went into armistice 50, 60 years ago. Um, and then one thing, again, how costly is this to the US? I think it's actually something that's in the US interest. Um, the White House, the President, should uh, establish an executive order that prevents, that prohibits the United States from deploying nuclear capable weapon systems to Korea unless authorized by the President. So some mid-ranking <coughs> military guy, some mid-ranking official in the US doesn't get to decide that we deploy nuclear bombers to South Korea that could trigger a war, right? That is a presidential level decision. So it doesn't say that we never do it, but executive orders have the force of law in the United States, and issuing a no nuclear deployment order would mean that only the president could decide that we should be sending nuclear bombers. So again, it's a way of reducing risk of nuclear war that's in America's interest. These are things that America should be doing in its own interest, but that would also happen to dramatically improve the environment within which nuclear negotiations occur. Only after we've done all this stuff can we jump to the things that nuclear negotiators really want to talk about. We need to prove to North Korea, the burden of proof is on us that our intentions are different, that we're not going to pull a Qaddafi on him, strip him of his weapons, and then gut him in the street. Right? That's on us to prove. So only after this stuff happens can we get to the normal stuff that you're going to hear everybody else talk about when it comes to nuclear negotiations. Oh, let's freeze and gradually roll back their program. Let's close Yongbyon nuclear complex. Yeah, let's do it. But it's not going to happen. Even that small thing is not going to happen unless we can change the context first, right? By the way, what is meant by Kim's bathroom? Let <laughs> 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 me go get that one. <laughs> so phase one, phase one, action one. We do need to freeze North Korea's nuclear activity without Kim's bathroom. So in the Iran nuclear negotiations during the Obama administration, the John Kerry, lead negotiator, Secretary of State, he had uh, he ran into a problem in negotiating with Iran because they're an enemy, right, of the United States. They called the problem the Ayatollah's bathroom because, as an enemy of the United States, there was an inherent right to state secrets, to military secrets. You cannot allow your enemy to see you in the bathroom. So nuclear inspectors must be on the ground, right? Nuclear inspectors must be able to monitor progress, verification, of course. The problem is that they cannot be anywhere and everywhere because then it eliminates all military advantages that the enemy has. This is a very practical matter. Unless you're, you are saying that they must unilaterally disarm <coughs> if you don't allow them any secrecy. So there has to be you have to accept the principle of the Ayatollah's bathroom, in North Korea's case, Kim Jong-un's bathroom. In principle, he is allowed to have some state secrets, and that must be accepted as part of the beginning of negotiations. The debate is where do you draw the line, what is acceptable to be hidden, what is not. But in the 90s when the US negotiated with North Korea, Negotiator like Bob Belushi and these they did not have the principle of, of Kim Il Sung's bathroom. It was, they wanted total transparency. The arms control guys in the State Department wanted total transparency. That's not going to work, particularly with a already nuclear North Korea. So we have to accept the principle of Kim's bathroom as a constraint in our negotiations. And I think that would actually make North Korea feel considerably more secure in the negotiations, which means they're not going to look for reasons to delay or to fight it or to not implement what they say. So we want to give North Korea as many reasons as possible to fulfill its commitments. And we've never done that before. And how many tactical nukes do you have to use over the Korean Peninsula? So we have... They have sharp reduction in the tactical uh, nuclear weapons, right? So we have no tactical nuclear weapons in Korea. I would like to keep it that way. Tactical nuclear weapons are usable nuclear weapons, and nobody wants to use nuclear weapons. Um, so what, what I 
What I want to happen, what I hope happens, is that U.S. negotiators can get, can convince North Korea preemptively to not develop tactical nuclear weapons themselves. And if that means we are, we have to give additional promises that we do not deploy tactical nuclear weapons to Korea, no problem, right? We've already, we're already going to do more than that. So we can have a mutual agreement to have no tactical weapons on the peninsula. Um, and that costs North Korea nothing, you know? But that would be huge for reducing risks again. So everything here is animated by this goal of reducing risks of nuclear war. What could be more important? Uh, we don't want North Korea to have tactical nukes, because tactical nukes are usable nukes. We don't want to have to introduce tactical nukes ourselves to Korea either, because that increases risks of use. And also, what do you mean by de-operationalize North Korean missile forces? Mm -hmm. Oh, so just uh, eventually, maybe after all this stuff is done, uh -huh. we need to get to a point where North Korea's missiles will not be on alert and will not be in the field. So it's just re it's increasing the amount of time between... If you mean de-alerting. Yes. Okay. And more. there are other ways to do it too, but it's just, it's creating more time and space between a decision to use new, <coughs> use new uh, missiles or posture with missiles and then actually shooting a missile. So creating more of a buffer um, and that would involve North Korean missile forces, and that would involve, that means you need to be engaging with them. You can't just let the North Korean Foreign Ministry handle that, right? The KPA handles that, which means we do have to have this dialogue. So all these things fit together. Um, and then eventually, we should get to a point where North, we have a verifiable phrase of North Korea's nuclear program. When we do that, we can try for, and we have a track record of both sides implementing agreements so that you have a modest base of trust that's established. We have credibly signaled the change of intentions because of this unilateral stuff. Then we can enter agreements for things like a nuclear free seas initiative. So within 200 nautical miles of the borders of the Korean Peninsula, we both agree uh, there will, neither side will put nuclear weapons into the seas, into the ocean, right? Um, and the reason why it comes so late is because there needs to be some sort of verification regime for that, patrols of some kind, monitoring, and so that would require compromises <coughs> from North Korea that I think they would not be willing to make initially. Um, and if we're going to reach agreements with North Korea, they need to be credible, implementable. Um, and then, after all of this happens, then we get to the part where everybody wants to start. So this is completely changing the goalposts of U.S. policy. Then we figure out how we can reduce medium-range and short-range ballistic and cruise missiles by North Korea. Uh, actually, personal, this is up for debate. I don't have a huge <laughs> problem with North Korean intercontinental ballistic missiles because the capability is less well developed. And if North Korea launches a long-range missile at US territory, it really is game over. Like that's, that's super war. That's tragedy. Um, but North Korea has lots of shorter range missiles that do not directly threaten the United States that it could easily and probably gladly launch at Japan or reluctantly launch at South Korea in a, certain, in a contingency, right? And so the, it's the medium and short range stuff that threatens allies directly. ICBMs are not intended to threaten the allies, it's intended to threaten the US directly. So I think it's a huge signal of US commitment and US leadership to accept that risk of the ICBM and say, you know what? We're at risk, but we're in. We're in it to win it. And we're gonna use negotiations to reduce the threat of missiles to allies. That's proof of our commitment to allies. And so um, the nuclear rollback, reducing, capping and reducing the number of weapons and the types of weapons that North Korea has, <clears throat> that can happen short of denuclearization, but it requires all this other stuff to happen first. Otherwise, why would North Korea do it? There's no, you have to give them as much incentive as possible to entertain 
reducing its nuclear deterrent. Um, and, then, and then, the final, most ambitious thing is the thing that some of my friends want us to do first, which is to get a declaration of North Korea's nuclear inventory. If, if your goal is denuclearization, you really do need an early declaration of inventory, because otherwise North Korea is lying to you. If they can't provide this declaration of nuclear inventory, there's no way they're going to denuclearize. And that's, that's true. That's why I say, A, they're not going to denuclearize. B, so what? So <laughs> let's, let's wait on this. There is no urgency to getting full transparency into North Korea's nuclear arsenal if we're accepting that they're going to have nuclear weapons. This, so this step, you want to achieve it eventually because it helps stability. But North Korea is only going to do this when it has sufficient confidence that we're not just going to light them up and target all the stuff that they've told us about. Um, and so this is a complete, this looks very boring, this is a complete 180 degree reversal of like everything America has tried with North Korea for the past 30 years. And that's, that's, what, the, that's what the controversy is. So I would freely admit even if the U.S. fully, faithfully implemented what I'm recommending here and all these proposals on the timeline that I've proposed, I fully admit there's like a 60% chance of success. Success being agreements that we reach with North Korea, that North Korea implements, and that the U.S. implements. Um, but that's how dismal the situation is. That's how much of a loser this situation has become for the United States. Um, the United States has lost on North Korea policy. We have to acknowledge it. And if you can't acknowledge when you've lost, you cannot learn. And if we know anything from international relations, it's that if you cannot learn, you cannot escape anarchy. You cannot escape the kind of world where everybody needs nukes, that justifies nukes. So we have to start by acknowledging the reality that we have lost on this goal that becomes more and more unrealistic over time. And only then can we show that we have learned, and only by learning can we proceed to actually make the world a bit safer. So why could this work where everything else has failed? Why could I be so audacious uh, and not even wear a tie today? Um, one reason is because it asks this whole blueprint proposal for arms control. It asks North Korea to give up much less than we've ever asked them to give up. Again, denuclearization equals unilateral disarmament. We're saying, North Korea, we acknowledge they're going to need a strategic deterrent. We acknowledge that we hate their nuclear weapons, but there are reasons why they have them. The issue is accountability and control and stability, particularly managing the risks of inadvertent nuclear use, which is plausible. Um, the second reason why this blueprint could work uh, is because even to the extent that we ask anything of North Korea, we significantly delay when we expect them to deliver on these things. We're not creating this um, very sensible tit-for-tat structure of negotiations like in the early 90s where you do something, we do something, you do something, we do something. It has to be the only way it succeeds is if everybody does everything perfectly. You have to have a discount for failure, for bureaucratic shortfalls, for hedging and mistrust. I mean, frankly, North Korea lied to us in the 90s. They, they violated the spirit of the agreed framework but not the letter of the law of the agreed framework. And it's understandable that they did so. It was a hedge. Because they cannot trust the United States. So we can't structure a, a negotiation or a bargain with North Korea that involves such perfectly synchronized move because no, no di diplomatic effort is ever perfectly executed, especially not with the United States, especially these days. Uh, so there needs to be... Um, time built in, say, you know what, there are things we need to do 
that may make you more secure, but we need to do it for us, all those unilateral actions. And that should prove to you that we're serious about looking at you and this situation differently. And then only then can we talk transactions. Um, and because of that, this is the only time that I know of that people talking about, or somebody talking about and proposing a, a roadmap for nuclear negotiations is primarily focused on how to make it credible, how to build trust, how to make it something that's more than a transaction. Um, and I, I hide the theory here. There, I don't put theory in the presentation or in the report, but what we know in political science, particularly for how like great power rivals dealing with smaller adversaries can build trust, we know it's very, very hard to do. It's almost impossible, but it can happen. <coughs> the key is to changing the narratives around transactionalism. And that's precisely what I've structured here. I've structured a real world version of how enemies become friends. Still, it's only a 60% chance of success. But that's better than the current 0% chance of success. Um, and North Korea does get things from what they, they get a lot of what they want from the proposed initiatives here. So how can uh, Steve Began and his successor actually convince North Korea to verifiably freeze, cap, roll back its nuclear weapons when it's never happened before? How specifically will the diplomats who sit down convince North Korea of, of those kinds of changes? Um, I have prescribed a basket of inducements or concessions that the United States could offer at the bargaining table. The timing, some of the content, it depends on the very fluid nature of negotiations. So I, I don't want to be overly prescriptive. Uh, but there are things the United States can do that are of acceptable risk levels for the United States, but that are valuable to North Korea, that North Korea wants. We all know right now, I mean, the main impediment on nuclear diplomacy right now is sanctions relief. North Korea has been reasonably clear about that. Um, I think in, in, a, in a different era, sanctions relief is too hard, not worth the effort, particularly because there's a good chance North Korea fails to fulfill its end of any bargain it makes with us. However, the alternative is that North Korea keeps developing nuclear weapons and the trajectory makes the US and its allies less stable relative to North Korea. The North Korea situation is less stable if we don't do something to change it. And if, the United, if, if North Korea, in a worst case scenario, gets sanctions relief, gets some degree of economic development, luxury goods are allowed to come back in the country or something, and then it takes all that and pockets it, and then gives up no nukes, like that can happen, right? We've had versions of that happen before. But does that threaten the Republic? Does that threaten the United States' existence? No. That is the kind of risk, the, ri the, the biggest risk that the United States would have in that scenario is the risk of diplomatic embarrassment. Like, oh man, North Korea took us to the cleaners. Again, they're such good negotiators. Okay. That's the worst case scenario if we grant sanctions relief, is that we look stupid. Okay, I'll be North Korea envoy. I'm willing to look stupid to make that happen, right? Because there's a chance that you take that move and it helps change things in a different context. Um, cooperative threat reduction funds, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is uh, congressional funding after the Cold War that was used to um, basically pay off former Soviet Union nuclear scientists and create programs for nuclear security um, to stabilize the post-Soviet environment and to control the spread of nuclear weapons. So it was about nuclear safety. And um, CTR funds, Cooperative Threat Reduction Funds, this is still a program that the US runs. Um, and since the end of the Cold War, it has spread from the Soviet Union to uh, countries all over the world. 
it is a general purpose fund that's targeted at nuclear security all around the world. Up to this point, there has never been any discussion that I know of about using these funds to enhance nuclear security in North Korea. Yet where could it be more useful than in North Korea? Where could it be more valuable to ensure nuclear safety and security than in North Korea? Um, so this is, again, it's like something that's in the U.S. interest because it's stability, it's reducing that risk of war and the risk of proliferation, but it's the kind of thing that would benefit North Korea too. North Korea doesn't want its nukes to escape, and North Korea would end up indirectly getting some foreign currency and funding. There, there's a financial element to this too that North Korea would benefit from. Um, and one of the co-sponsors of the legislation that initially created this, so the non uh, Senators uh, Nunn Luger in the United States, in the middle of the, the nuclear crisis with North Korea, they proposed that this funding should be available for North Korea situations. So it's not like I'm making this up myself. Like the originators of the legislation think that this is something that could make sense in the future. Um, and then the everybody knows the value of the peace regime process, right? Um, controversial, but also necessary in some sense. It's not something the United States could do alone either. It's a multi-party thing. Um, the, the the biggest controversy here is what I've labeled phased true production in South Korea. And again, this is part of a bargaining inducement with North Korea. So like how you would structure this very much depends on the circumstances and the negotiations, where we are with North Korea, the strategic relationship. Um, but I've, I've sketched out a proposal, it's not in this report, it's, it's something separate, that argues that you could, in the name of deterrence, in the name of actually enhancing deterrence, not just diplomacy, you could reduce the presence of U.S. troops in Korea to about 14,000 and have a stronger deterrent than you do right now. Because it's about modernizing the deterrence posture. It's about structuring forces in South Korea to pose a minimum offensive threat to North Korea, but to make maximum ability to uh, react rapidly, decisively, to any kind of like North Korean physical attack. And so you structure forces in such a way that their purpose is not the classical tripwire of U.S. forces here exist so that you can bring 300,000 troops into the peninsula. And that's not, the, that's, that's not their purpose. Their purpose is to respond quickly to events that happen in the, you know, the West Sea or the Yellow Sea. And it happens somewhere uh, along the DMZ. And so it's amphibious forces, it's Marines, it's cruise missiles, it's advanced technology, fifth generation fighters. But it's a, that's a modest presence in terms of size. So if you change, if you restructure the composition of, of the troop presence here, you could achieve an even greater deterrent capability, but you could do so in a way that reduces the risk of offensive threat to North Korea. And to be able to do that with fewer troops is like win, win, win. Right. Um, and so that would be, again, something that I think is in the alliance interest and in the U.S. interest and done for reasons of deterrence, but it has value within the negotiation context. I think that's it. Um, oops, the so if I say there's a 60% chance of success, 40% chance of failure if we do this, um, there is this question of how you manage the risks. So this should be part, any strategy is going to have risks. The issue is like, how transparent are you about the risks that your strategy generates, and how do you manage those risks? So um, there is a risk with North Korea that if, if negotiations fail, if an arms regime, arms control regime fails with North Korea, all that's left for stability is deterrence. So 
we need to, separate from the negotiation process, we need to adjust our force posture in Korea in a way that does reduce troops, but does so, like I said, in a manner that strengthens deterrence. The types of capabilities that you have is what matters, not the number of troops when it comes to deterrence. And so as a way to ensure deterrence against a North Korea that it has nuclear weapons and where we have no arms control regime in place, no restraining mechanisms in place, uh, one of the things we need to do is update or moder modernize our deterrence posture. Um, and again, that involves like a longer proposal, but the number is like somewhere between 14 and 17,000 troops. So whose boots are here? Very different than what's set up now. More modern, more high tech, more um, frankly like marines and special forces and fewer army. Uh, the second thing is like we have with the US and South Korea alliance, even now we have these extended deterrence consultation mechanisms, right? Um, and it's a way of trying to reassure South Korea of the US commitment generally and of the commitment of the nuclear umbrella to South Korea's defense in particular. Um, obviously this is something that is not emphasized in the current era because it's, it's at odds with trying to build uh, goodwill with North Korea. <coughs> um, but if, we, if the United States does this proposal that I'm making, depending on who's running South Korea, like liberal or conservative administration, there could be huge alliance concerns, angst, fear of abandonment, based on what is being proposed here. And again, it depends on who's in charge here. But um, even in a liberal administration, like if this happened right now, I think the Moon administration might have some concerns about some of the things I'm proposing, right? And so the United States has to invest in mechanisms, institution building that systematically ensures that when we make decisions about North Korea, we're consulting with allies. One of the problems in the nuclear crisis in 2017 was that the United States was making all of this bombastic you know, threat making, all the rhetoric, fire and fury stuff, that was not done in consultation with South Korea. South Korea was not on board with the bloody nose idea, right? Um, and so we have a reassurance problem with South Korea that my arms control report raises. Any arms control initiative with North Korea creates a reassurance problem with South Korea and Japan. And so we need to start um, building mechanisms to ensure that we don't heighten feelings of ally abandonment too much. Basic, this is common sense, you know, the ABCs of how do you take care of your alliance, right? Just be considerate of your, of your ally. Um, and then finally, um, we do need sanctions relief to make this process work. North Korea is after sanctions relief. Any negotiation process that excludes sanctions relief is a process that I believe North Korea will not be interested in. But there are, there are some sanctions that other countries use to enforce the global non-proliferation regime. And so when we relieve sanctions, we need to be careful that we're not inadvertently relieving sanctions that New Zealand or, some, or Canada or some other democracy uses at the national level to implement their legal guidance for their military to enforce sanctions. Because we still don't want nuclear weapons to proliferate, right? So in the near term and the foreseeable future, we have to be selective about what kinds of sanctions we uh, grant relief for. But that's, that's doable. It just means consultation with more allies and more partners um, to make sure we're not doing something completely irresponsible. But we can do that. We just haven't been doing it. And so these are ways of managing the risks of this larger proposal to uh, initiate an arms control process. And then this is just the mic drop punchline. Um, it's the paradox of the whole situation. If you have an arms control regime, you do, you will be substantially closer to denuclearization than you are right now. But to get an arms control regime, you have to actually give up on denuclearization. So you've got to give up on denuclearization to move closer to denuclearization. And that sucks, but it's true, and it's real. 
and I'm the only one being honest. <laughs> Excellent presentation. Very dynamic, very informative. Okay, open to the floor. Here you are. Hi, uh, my name is Don Kirk. You seem to think you have the answer to everything. Uh, do you know what we should do now, now that North Korea has said that they're not going to talk to President Trump right now, and now that they've said this end of the year done? Okay, so here we are. What do we do now? Yeah, but I think you know, Don is making very important points. You know, now, what you're saying is really paradigm shift yeah. from denuclearization to arms control. Yeah. But uh, we are all embedded in arms control paradigm. Therefore, really, how to make a shift? Yeah. Okay. So Trump, inadvertently, I think, Trump has helped change a little bit the space for negotiations. Um, I'm giving him zero credit, by the way. But the situation now is such that we have alleviated the, the concerns about, like, oh, if we do something with North Korea, it grants them international status. We've lost that, right? Like, Trump has given up that as an argument against doing arms control. And so, um, and then we've suspended military exercises, right? We've shown we're willing to do certain things, but we do them in isolation. We do one-off things. Yeah, but what do we do now? Okay, what do we do? But you did possible. Here we are, what do we do? But, but, but okay, now, as an extension of Don's you know, question, is it possible for us to combine this denuclearization paradigm with arms control paradigm? In, in other words, to the public audience, okay? Yeah. Because it has the audience course, you know. Sure. We come up with denuclearization, but actual agenda can be set up in accordance with your suggestions. So, I don't, this is something a lot, some people will disagree with. I think in the Trump era, or like any situation where Trump remains president, we can't actually achieve anything because we can't any achieve anything that's like long term or that has long-term implications that's good because Kim Jong-un is not stupid. Kim Jong-un is rational and he's been able to size up or estimate Trump already. He knows the man is manipulable, that he's enough, he's hubristic and egocentric enough and he's proven that he's willing to give Kim Jong-un certain things that previous presidents weren't, like a summit. So in, un, under these circumstances, I think Kim Jong-un sees Trump as a soft target. And that means that Kim Jong-un has no incentives. Also, Trump is so different from yeah, Washington. I'm asking, so. not asking that. I'm asking what do we do now? Uh, because of this end of the year deadline, because of their refusal to talk. What's the next step we do now? Oh, so now that we've maneuvered ourselves into an yeah. impossible this is, situation, this is the what situation. do we do? This is the situation. So what do we do? So what do we do after we've maneuvered ourselves into an unwinnable situation? We have to do nothing immediately <laughs> except when we, uh, some of the, unilateral it's not up there, but yeah, some of these unilateral actions, like um, adjusting our force posture in the, in the Korean Peninsula, you can start doing that now because it's a longer process. And it doesn't, this is not a concession to North Korea, but it could, it could make marginal uh, improvements to yeah. the negotiating situation. <clears throat> and it's something that you're doing in the name of deterrence. They I say, think they said they're not going to negotiate. Hey, what are we, you know, we're, oh, okay. we're okay. Yeah, yeah, but that's fine. They don't have to don't okay. they don't, I'm not getting an answer to my question. Okay. Well, by the way, the, your answer can emerge in the process of discussions <laughs> here. Okay. What next? You're trying to be transactional about a situation that cannot be won transactionally. That's he he wanted a magic mean, solution. But word, you don't have a magic solution, okay? I don't even know the word transactional, by the way. I don't, I don't understand that. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what that word means. You've used it several times. Okay. Who else? Not in my vocabulary. Okay, Dan. Okay. Um, thanks for coming, Ben. And um, I'm agitated by a lot of things, but to be honest, I didn't read the report. I downloaded it. I went back to states last month for death and family, D23 class, and all that. So I will read it, and I'll get back some specific um, comments. But a couple things: hand waving. You know, North Korean commitment problem. We just kind of dismissed. I mean, they have a serious commitment problem, right? That has to be overcome. So that was just kind of brushed aside. So that's something we have to address. As far as interest in arms control, everybody's interested in arms control. I mean, it's like, it sounds like Culture Club that Boy George or Girl George in the 80s, no more wars, no, you know, like arms control. Everybody wants arms control. Why North Korea seems the least interested in arms control when they should be the 
most interest in arms control because yeah. they're, they're the weakest country in a tough neighborhood. So if they would show more interest in arms control, and the U.S. has made a lot of mistakes, you know, don't get me wrong, I mean, total failures. With the agreed framework, should have pushed it, accelerated it, but because of all the domestic political issues, access to people, all the other things, but that was then, this is now. But as far as now, there are indicators that we could see if North Korea, I mean, they signed the Outer Space Treaty. They were condemned for that, but that's great. Okay, let's, there's a longer list of space arms control. If you're really interested in, in uh, peaceful access to outer space, why do you need intermediate range missiles? Those aren't space launchers. Um, you signed the, the registration convention. There are other space laws. Okay, you signed the NPT withdraw, withdrew, but why didn't you sign the CWC? You claim you didn't have chemical weapons. There are other, like, low hanging fruit. I mean, they didn't even sign. Let me sign the uh, UN Security Council uh, 1540, which requires the prevention and legislation to prevent the transfer of WMD to non state actors, to terrorist groups. North Korean diplomats say, we don't want to do that anyway. So this is not even asking you to do something that you wouldn't do. The Comprehensive Military Agreement, the Inter Korean Agreement, I'm not caught up on that, but it was signed last year, right? And that's kind of stalled. So I was very hopeful with that. So if we get in some kind of arms control agreement, they did provide some information back in the early 90s on the uh, Biological and Toxic Weapons Convention, providing some information on that. So there are some other things we could, we could move on in biological weapons, biological security, those types of things, CWC, you know, arms trade uh, agreement, a lot of arms control things that they could do, but they express no interest whatsoever. So why is the onus only on the U.S. Last thing is that, you know, Korean War, so declaring in the Korean War, which one? People joke about this, I counted five Korean Wars. So I know a Korean say they won the Fatherland Liberation War. When you win a war, why do you want some kind of terms of peace treaty? They claim that they won that. The Korean Revolution, the Joseon Hyungyun, that's been going on since at least 1830s. So unless there's some kind of political arrangement, so like in Northern Ireland or something like that, the party in that you stop fighting the revolution and you commit to peaceful coexistence with the Republic of Korea. That's what Koreans did to resolve. But that is not an insignificant issue. The Chinese had, their war was to aid the Koreans and resist American imperialism. I think they stopped fighting that when they withdrew their troops from North Korea and they withdrew from the JSA and all that. And North Korea has this Yu-Gi-Oh! Chinyak, you know, that's a different kind of war. So the concept of that... Okay, what's your point? Okay. So, so it's just... Um, you can't trust North Koreans then. <laughs> no, well, well, they have a commitment problem. Okay, the, the, the yeah, commitment right. problem. You, you can't trust a lot North of Koreans. Yeah. Okay. There's, a, there's a lot of things that is kind of brushed over. And um, anyway, I'll write you a note next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. like, there's so much of what you said is totally valid, right? Like, I'm a Pentagon guy. Like, I'm not a psychopath. <laughs> I'm not an idiot about this stuff, right? Like, I'm a deterrence expert. Uh, like I've been sizing up North Korea my entire adult life. You know, you're my son, <laughs> um, The Everything you're, so much of what you're saying is true. The problem is that like arms control in the context of denuclearization is not arms control. It's a path to denuclearization. And so when the culminating point of all of the smaller agreements is supposed to be reducing the strategic, not even reducing, eliminating North Korea's strategic deterrent, that's a fundamental problem. That encourages bad faith. North Korea does have commitment problems, but so does the U.S. And structurally, the burden has to be on the United States because it's the great power, because its existence is not at stake, whereas North Korea's is. It's just obvious. What is okay, oh. well, uh, you want to vote? If, okay, la okay. Well, if we have, we have a, a preference over outcomes, and I think we probably list that, and we could all agree, probably most people agree, prevent nuclear wars and prevent nuclear war, prevent conventional war, prevent, you know, attacks, conflict, prevent proliferation, we can kind of go down the list. So those are probably pretty constant, pretty steady. But if I want to achieve those outcomes, those are my preference over outcomes. And as far as achieving, um, as far as developing the strategies to achieve those outcomes, mm -hmm. so if I have that, that kind of end goal of denuclearizing North Korea, right? or preventing the next Byongjin line country, the next proliferator popping up. How are the strategies really that different? As well, far as what I would do to, you know, so, you know, maybe, maybe I don't think North Korea is going to denuclearize at all, but I, I don't. I mean, the cons current conditions, the, the mindset of thinking. But I want to prevent the next country. I want to falsify the Byongjin line. I don't want that to be like the development strategy. We end up in a situation like President Kennedy, you know, had nightmares about. 
Okay, Tony. Um, <clears throat> Anthony Kuhn with NPR. Um, just to rephrase Don's question a different way, North Korea is saying the window is closing. Mm -hmm. After it closes, we're off to the new way. How can you succeed? Either you're saying the, the new way is a bluff, or it's reversible. If we start doing things unilaterally the right way, they'll come back. I don't, this is the, I don't think we're in a winnable situation right now. I think the end of your deadline is not a bluff. I don't know, I don't have any like magic insight in, as to what it is they will actually do, because they have a range of things that they could do that would be provocative or coercive in nature. So I don't, I don't think it's a bluff. I think that would be a huge mistake to think that uh, still. But there's nothing that we, like, what are we going to do about it in the short term? Nothing. We have, like, we have narrowed our situation and the choices available to us right now in the context of a sort of erratic President Trump's policy preferences, his caprice. What are we gonna, what are we gonna do? We can't do anything except kind of re be in reaction mode for now. So what I'm talking about is a multi-year thing and it's gonna, be, it's gonna work best if you can start with a new presidency. Because under the current presidency, North Korea will probably try to pocket whatever gains it can get. If we want to do that, that's fine. We, we're, our, our livelihood is not damaged too much if North Korea takes advantage of us at the negotiating table. Um, but we have, to use, we have to do something long term. Short term, we just don't have many options. So uh, managing the risks of nuclear stability and thinking about that stuff is like the best we can do for now. And then wait out the Trump administration. Okay. People are concerned about end of year deadline, but what are we going to Okay, uh, you, you're from where? You, you. Um, yeah, um, hi, Gar, I'm, like, I'm heading the political department of the German embassy. So I would first like to say that I do not agree. <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay. Okay. German, German foreign ministry always goes with the American State Department. Okay. <laughs> Hard <No. line> <laughs> <laughs> We go with partners and the U.S. is a very important partner. Uh, and yeah, but yeah, I, I will not ask about the uh, multilateral framing. I, I have a personal question. In this situation, when it obviously seems not able to get out of the deadlock um, to, to change the paradigm, because I, I don't see that the international community is ready to do this right now, because we still count on, 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 on pressure and on some getting them back to the table. Uh, how, what do you think uh, at the end of the year? Maybe another alternative apart from the diplomatic reappear in discussions. I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> yeah, okay, you say we cannot reach denuclearization right. and it's hard to change the paradigm to this feasible, more feasible arms control uh, goal. Um, do you think there's a still a military option, a risk, if uh, the process will and, fail? As an extension of you know, her question, what is it meant by blood known strategy? Yeah. You know? oh, US folks talked about blood known strategy, but yeah. we don't know what it is. You know what? What, what is the difference between limited and preventive yeah. strikes? Yeah, so, yeah this was on the, the The idea in 2017 emerged uh, from the National Security Council in the US that. Um, one of the ways to um, convince North Korea that it cannot continue with developing nuclear weapons was to strike one or two or however many nuclear or missile sites for coercive purposes as an as a enhancement to deterrence. The so they, they call that the bloody nose strategy. Okay, or, Kim, Kim Jong-un a bloody nose. Okay, then you have, you know, what? You know, man master used the term preventive war, okay? Mm -hmm. And Washington pundit were using the term preemptive, you know, strike. Yeah. And then blood knows. They're all the same words with d different names. Well, they mean slightly different things, but the idea in all of them is that <laughs> the bottom line is we will hit North Korea. <laughs> it was just a question of timing and conditions, etc. Um, that would be a huge mistake. The, 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 that thinking is reflective of the old paradigm of denuclearization. That's part of the problem. Because you can only justify things like a bloody, giving Kim Jong-un a bloody nose 
if you are blind to the fact that you would be doing that against a nuclear state. I mean, in a practical sense, not in the like symbolic NPT sense of nuclear state. In a practical sense, you don't launch preventive strikes against nuclear states. You don't do it. Why? Because there's substantial risk of nuclear war. And you can't control the outcome of what starts happening at that point. So the most responsible thing you can do is reduce the risks of nuclear war means that you have to foreclose on certain options like a bloody nose. Um, now, if you have very high confidence that North Korea is going to launch an attack against the United States, that would be preemptive strike, hit a missile but while it's still on the ground, or hit a missile while it's in the air, because then you're saving that missile from hitting the United States. Right? That would be preemptive, not preventive. And that's very different from like a bloody nose notion. The bloody nose thing is, is off the table. I believe it would be off the table in a democratic administration. It's my opinion. But, you know, we have one really fundamental and existential and political dilemma here. Okay. We have been telling that the denuclearization, complete denuclearization, or final, fully verified denuclearization, or complete and, you know, complete verifiable and irreversible denuclearization, have been so, have socialized people in Korea, U.S., and etc. as an untouchable goal of respective governments, and then all of a sudden you're saying that uh, we got to change the paradigm from denuclearization to arms control. Then you'll be assuming that uh, you'll be recognizing North Korea as a nuclear weapon state. Mm -hmm. Then now, who can you know, you know, bite the bullet? There can, can be political suicide in the U.S., South Korea, Japan, even China. Then might then might not be acceptable. How can we solve this problem? It's purely in you know, a political problem. Yeah, I mean that's what has inhibited all of us from doing it up to this point. Then, but we're also in a, a, the the mindset that prevents you from doing that is the mi same mindset that leads you to recommend, to think that you have no choice but to go down a bloody nose path. And that's not acceptable. If, if we're going to plan internally, if we're going to develop policies and military postures, etc., that acknowledge North Korea it has nuclear weapons, that it's a nuclear armed state or adversary or whatever, we should not be endlessly saying the opposite publicly. We have, we're, we're, we're captives to our own rhetorical problem. We're trapping ourselves. Um, I, I've seen no cost to Trump for being just a complete rhetorical violator of, of all that is sacred and all that is taboo. And I'm not suggesting that we all follow suit, but it does make me wonder about uh, what kind of political cost anybody would suffer because there's not much proof that anybody would suffer political costs for reorienting the paradigm. Particularly if the United States does so, there, there's a way to do this in like a low key way where you just stop talking about denuclearization. You're still talking about nuclear negotiations. You're just not, you're not reinforcing these, these ridiculous symbols of like FFVD, CVID. Get, get rid of that stuff and just talk about the practicalities of it. I think people would support that. That's realism. People like claims of being real. Um, and there's something credible about being honest. And so I'm not, I'm not naive about North Korea. There is a threat here. There is a chance we get taken advantage of. There is a chance that North Korea does not deliver even minimal concessions on its nuclear deterrent. But again, the alternative to trying, um, the, the alternative to making unilateral concessions is a continuation of what we have now. I think it's horrible to, to me. Ben makes a whole lot of sense, realistic sense. Okay, therefore, our approach has been then because a lot of people then raise and uh, North Korea has at least you know from 30 to you know, 16 nuclear warheads. Okay, it has uh, delivery vehicles. Okay, the missiles. Okay, it conducted you know nuclear testing six times, okay, then North Korea is a de facto nuclear weapon state. But we're saying that uh, we are approaching as if North Korea does not <laughs> nuclear weapons, okay. Then one solution is this, okay, from 
in the in the during the transitional period. You know, we may you know recognize that North Korea is a nuclear weapon state, but still our ultimate goal is to denuclearize North Korea completely and permanently. Okay, but I don't know whether the kinds of this uh, middle range approach makes sense. Well, so I think if we don't try to do something significantly different which involves more than just like doing one thing or two things. It's actually a series of initiatives over time. <coughs> it's a reorientation. If we don't do that, 10 years from now, North Korea will have 100 nuclear weapons, 200 nuclear weapons. And the situation will be just as now, but more so. And who does that benefit? It does not benefit us. It does not benefit the free world. And that's, that's the default. OK, well, would you identify yourself? Yeah, Edward White with the Financial Times, um, fellow Wellington. Um, <laughs> oh, you're from <laughs> Wellington. <laughs> uh, in the spirit of some of the other questions, people are obviously very focused on just getting through the next couple of months yeah, yeah. Uh, in one piece. And interested to know, out of the things that you've proposed that might uh, come in as some sort of new paradigm blueprint, which of these um, we might look at them as concessions. Um, do you think the North Koreans are most likely to accept in the sense that what is the sort of things that if the US position in negotiations were to be changed slightly from these kind of um, irreversible denuclearization steps that people have been talking about, are there smaller inducements that could be introduced just to get a might be a sort of one of these interim deals, some sort of small win that Trump can take to his voters, just as enough to save face on both sides. Is there anything under what you've proposed that you think the North Koreans would be likely to jump at? And whether it's snapback, uh, whether it's sanctions reductions and snapback provisions, or whether it's some sort of peace negotiations, or what are they more likely to go for? Yeah, so the obvious near term thing, and this addresses Don's point too. Mm -hmm. The obvious near-term thing that would be most likely to affect North Korea in a positive way is to grant the, the, five, the five sets of sanctions that date back to 2016 um, and then build in some sort of snapback provisions like we did with Iran in the event that there are violations. Um, that is something that we can do politically. It seems very unlikely. The reason why I didn't suggest that in response to Don's question is because anything we we do like that for North Korea now, if it's just done in isolation, just like the suspended exercises, the effect will be null. The strategic effect will be, it, it's just throwing away capital, throwing away leverage. And so like, we just gotta get past this Trump phenomenon. And if we can, or Trump becomes permanent dictator. And then, but either way, like, we need to change the current Trump is here but temporary thing. Um, and then once we're in a different, setting, you can get value out of doing things like this snapback sanctions relief. So that's something very specific that North Korea does specifically want and that would be the right kind of signal. But if you do it in isolation, you're just giving, <laughs> you're no. giving something that won't change the nuclear situation. But uh, let, me you know, let me defend in a vast position his, you know, those five major incentives. For example, peace treaty and, and declaration to end the Korean War. That has been discussed between Seoul and Washington, and also with Pyongyang too. It's a not very difficult deal. You know? mm -hmm. And second, you know, reduction, phased reduction of US forces in South Korea. If defense cost sharing negotiation, special measure agreement negotiation does not go well, then there is a saying that the uh, you know, US will be putting out okay, one brigade. There's about 3,000. But U.S. Congress kept 22,000 you know, troop sides. Therefore, maybe President Trump can use. Now, we have, the U.S. has about, what, 27,500 you know, U.S. forces in South Korea. Then he has at least you know, leverage for the you know, five to 6,000 you know, troops. Maybe he can do it. You know? He can pull out two in you know, a brigade from South Korea. But as Ben suggests, we can link it to you know, nuclear negotiation with North Korea. Okay, therefore, we can use it as a very valuable card. Snapback sanction, according to North Korean in a report, President Trump raised the issue of snapback 
sanctions in Hanoi. Then, following the, when there was extended in a summit talk, um, Pompeo and Bolton reversed in a Trump's in a decision. This is what North Koreans have been complaining. Therefore, snapback in a sanction is not totally new. Yeah. Okay. And another CTR. If when I given my conversation with North Koreans, okay, I attended this, in the first, second, third summit. Okay. If the U.S. can come up with non luga bill yeah. with a specific funding. <laughs> then North Korea will take it as more serious commi commitment on the part of the United States. At the time, you know, even North Koreans knew that the amount of money is $15 billion. Okay? Therefore, CTL is very familiar with the North Koreans. Therefore, if the United States, U.S. Congress can, can come up with actual funding for city corporate threat reduction fund for North Korea, and South Korea will join, and Japan will join too. Then I think North Korean behavior will be changing. I don't know about the sanction related working group and etc., but they can be done very. But you're essentially talking about offering. Sorry, just to follow up. I mean, yeah. you're essentially talking about offering these concessions for free, just to get through. No, no, not, not unilateral. They're tied up to the you know what you know you know Ben suggests the phase one and phase two. They're you know, a whole this. Uh, unilateral action by the United States, as well as those five to six you know, incentives which Ben, ben mentioned you know, can be you know, packed into overall negotiation package vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. If the United States show those options up front, then North Korea will move because all those are related to the, what North Koreans argue so-called complete and irreversible withdrawal of American hostile policy against North Korea, death threats and North Korean security and North Korean people's right to existence and development. Because, because they're all related. They're fine. In other words, what Ben is saying is it really has a realistic you know, prospect too. But we simply do not think about it. Because as Ben has been suggesting, okay, okay, it's a whole North Korea is a demon. Okay? And North Korea committed a lot of crimes. Therefore, North Korea got to be punished. After North Korea shows a repenting behavior, then we may have a real meaningful negotiation. I, that is not the right way of doing things. And I think, that, I think that the van is really suggesting sheer realism, okay? Because we have been tra trapped into some kinds of <coughs> unilateral you know, idealism that we can compel North Korea alter its behavior, but it is not, as he pointed out. North Korea has been responding yet, to external pressures with more resistance. Okay. Therefore, in a sense, I'm taking side with the bad. <laughs> okay. Who, uh, identify yourself. I'm um, Suyong Pai from the Australian Embassy. I'm the research officer there. And I'm also a person of the North Korea Watcher. So my, I've got some very personal uh, question as a North Korea Watcher. And thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I want to go back to uh, Ben's, point about, about, yeah. Ben's point about the North Korea's commitment issues. So um, I agree with your proposals, and then the U.S. or South Korea can make any unilateral actions taken before what North Korea does, and then does not have to um, tie North Korea or impose on them about the denuclearization in order to get to the denuclearization. But the problem here is that how we can impose North Korea on making the commitment to our proposals, for example, South Korea proposed the mountain gungan dialogues mm. and comprehensive military agreement. Mm. We were proposed a lot, we made actions first, but North Korea simply ignored them and yeah. did not make any moves at all. Yeah. So, for example, going back to your suggestions about the institutionalized uh, strategic security dialogue, which is, I think, is a very good idea because it's the only the way to narrow down the gaps mm. between the North Korea and the Washington in terms of what nuclearization, denuclearization means yeah. or what arms control means. But the problem here is that North Korean officials wearing different hats to mm. the every occasion uh, of the meetings. Is that possible to have actually 1.5? Uh, track dialogue, is it really possible to have technical dialogue with North Korea having 
the U.S. experts there and then North Korean experts there. Oh, that's great. By the way, that's not in 1.5. Everything. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Well, that's also the same for all of Asia, frankly. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Right. Well, the simple question is how we can make North Korea move. How make we can make North Korea respond to our proposals and our actions. Mm -hmm. So there's there's uh, some historical indications, maybe not immediately, that uh, the North Korean military and national security officials have at some point wanted some dialogue or something with the United States. They, I think they feel pretty burned at this point and um, they leave diplomacy to the diplomats. Um, but that's a, the fact that like, there, has, there was a point in time where they were interested in talking to us means that there may be a future interest in talking to us. And maybe one of the reasons, one of many reasons why uh, the North Korean military and the NDC, National Defense Commission, that they are so kind of hawkish against the United States is because they have no incentive in a bureaucratic sense or in a professional sense for dialogue with the United States. They get nothing out of that. That's the, that's the foreign ministry show. And so there is a possibility of having a, the kinds of discussions with North Korea that we have had with communist China. And so China is the precedent that proves that it's at least possible to do this kind of uh, strategic discussion with North Korea, with other stakeholders other than the foreign ministry. It doesn't mean don't meet diplomats, but just broaden engagement, right? Um, but let, let me add to the Vance position. It is unfair to criticize that North Korea has not been honoring the commitment. They have honored the commitment. In fact, in many cases, we have failed to meet the commitment. Okay? And our government, our leader, President Moon, he said, okay, we'll suspend joint military exercise and training. But we have been doing it. Okay? We, in, in fact, increased the frequency. Okay? And also, North Korea signed the September 19th you know, military agreement, 2018. North Korea has been abiding by that agreement. Okay? They don't do exercises, you say? Not joint exercise. No, North Korea is not doing its own exercise? Oh, its own exercise, but North Korea behavior always responsive to our... Okay. But the whole point is this, you know, because if we decide to reduce, you know, hostile intention and action, then we should honor on the mutual. Yeah, but these exercises that we've been doing are sort of computer games. Hey, so what? It doesn't matter, you know. But, oh. but what is important is North Korean perception. Like we can't play with the computers then? <laughs> okay. <laughs> One thing I don't understand, you keep on talking about talking to their military, mm -hmm. NDC. The chairman of the NDC is Kim Jong-un. No, 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 there's no NDC nowadays. Yeah. National yeah. Defense Commission. Yeah. No, no, no. It's just, State of his, you know. All right, great. But but the chairman is Kim Jong-un. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's not going to be some general down there uh, who may be quite competent and may have a lot of power. But he's not the one who's going to decide all this. It's going to be Kim Jong-un. Of course, Kim Jong-un is the decider. Okay, so, so how are we going to get through? What, what, what are these military talks all about if he doesn't want to talk? He said he doesn't want to talk to uh, President Trump anymore because Trump isn't making concessions or whatever. So this is actually one of my concerns, and I was going to respond, I was going to add on to Ed's question. I'm concerned that North Korea feels like it might have been conned by Trump, because Trump <coughs> led Kim Jong-un to believe, maybe in not so many words, but led him to believe that sanctions relief was forthcoming, that military exercises were going to be like indefinitely canceled. Trump was signaling all kinds of things. He was saying things about troop withdrawal, right? And so Trump, and who knows what he said privately, and so Trump has led Kim Jong-un to believe that there were all these goodies that are going to be coming his way, and that maybe he wasn't going to have to do all that much to get it. And so we've created this false expectation that poss quite possibly North Korea feels pissed off about. Um, and that, that could well help explain the end of year deadline. It doesn't help us with what to do now, because like, like I said, I think sanctions relief is essential. I think granting the sanctions relief that they want from the UN Security Council resolution since 2016 is essential, but I think if we're doing it now in the current context with Trump sitting there, it just doesn't achieve anything. Okay, yes. Um, I, I didn't for yourself. <coughs> Tim Broth from the Nauman Foundation. Um, we do capacity oh, programs yeah. in North Korea. 
Um, thank you very much for the, for the um, really great presentation. Uh, I think a lot of great points were already raised that I agree with here. Um, but I want to come back to one point. Um, you didn't really mention about China and China's role in your concept. So regardless of what we do next, or I understand your paradigm is of a, of a greater picture. But in that greater picture of paradigm shift, how does this, that, this greater game dynamics of East Asia play in? That we also saw that South Korea, the U.S. started the summits, and China right jumped in and, and really uh, um, showed again that it is the player that you cannot ignore here on the Korean Peninsula. Yeah. How, how, yeah, can you elaborate a little bit on your view on China in your uh, overall paradigm? So what I know as a historical fact is that China has never been able to control North Korea, but policymakers, including when I served, believed that China could control North Korea. So we invested a lot of political capital in convincing China to convince North Korea to do stuff. It almost never worked. Like that's, it's just such wrong-headed thinking. It's anti-empirical thinking, like historic, it's at odds with history. And uh, so my concern about making China too much of a stakeholder or relying on China too much, the reason you do, I don't talk about China here is because of that fact, that China does not control North Korea and North Korea does not trust China. They're kind of allies of convenience, um, and I think that China, at best, can just be a, like, a, a facilitator. Like you saw when we did the summit, they jumped on that bandwagon. I think the concept of momentum in world politics is a real thing. You can create you, momentum of creating a certain direction of a policy, can convince others to change things quickly, even when originally it seemed like it was impossible. I think the summits are an example of that. Now, more than that, the highest official position is this. Nuclear issue is just between Pyongyang and Washington. And China is willing to assist them, to facilitate the process of negotiation between Washington and Pyongyang. Therefore, China has never exceeded that boundary. But if the negotiation affect the national interest of China, China will you know, vehemently you know, oppose or protest. But Otherwise, you know, China want in the U.S. and North Korea to, you know, proceed with, you know, uh, kind of negotiation which, you know, Ben proposed. You want to raise your um, comments? Yes, yes, in addition to the first general question on options, because we don't get positive assessment of the situation yeah. right now yeah. for the last few weeks. Um, um, thank you very much for your presentation, and I think some of the uh, bargains or uh, the, the issues that the U.S. should give or could give to the North have also been discussed within denuclearization discussions. Um, snapback sanctions had popped up um, some months ago too. Yes. Do you mean U.S. sanctions? Which sanctions do you mean uh, in your suggestion? So North Korea is referring to UN Security Council based sanctions mm -hmm. since 2016. Yes. Um, and the, so those are very concrete. The US has implemented those sanctions through executive order for the mm -hmm. most part. Um, and so the United States, every country that's implementing yeah. sanctions, right, they're developing national law, national guidance mm -hmm. based on what is determined at the UN. So it's this very complicated mm -hmm. structure. So snapback sanctions would have to involve the United States taking the lead on implementing sanctions relief itself, but also convincing allies to do the same. Um, and so there's a certain amount of political capital that's necessary to make uniform implementation happen. But frankly, I think that if the United States changed its, changed its face on this situation, and said, look, we're trying to provide the sanctions relief that we think will jumpstart the situation, change the situation. Uh, it would put the burden on allies to justify why not. Um, and this is the concept of momentum once again. So it currently does not seem feasible based on your government's position. But if the United States dramatically changed how it approached this and took up the public microphone on this in a certain way, we've seen that it can lead to momentum in that direction. Okay, one final comment or question. And Can I ask a question? I'm a political economist. My name is Jane Park. 
From um, where? I'm consulting for the American University of Beirut from remote. For what? Hey, oh, I think we follow each other remote. on Twitter. I missed it. Anyway, uh, just a quick question. So on the institutional part that you mentioned about executive orders, yeah. and before that, um, the strategic and economic, sorry, strategic, strategic security dialogue that mm -hmm. you mentioned, I believe the SNED, they lapsed, or the Trump administration ended it. So is there political room for that in Washington? That's number one. Mm -hmm. And can you please spare us from executive orders? Because in trade wars right now, there are just so many mm -hmm. that disrupt the whole system. So if you if you keep giving credit or credibility to the Trump administration on utilizing executive orders, it just becomes very, very, it's just so intrinsic in the system right now that the validity of executive orders is becoming a little bit of a, I don't know how to explain it, but it's just not working. There's an abuse of power that's happening exactly. because of executive primacy, yeah. But that's also the structure of the situation. Like. You, if you, executive orders have the force of law until Congress decides otherwise, and so... Even on Saudi Arabia right now, if, if it's a congressional thing, then it still has some political implication, and yeah. it, it's just stalemate in the Congress, so mm -hmm. I'm just wondering why you were utilizing executive orders. Yeah, I'm not a fan of Trump's use of executive orders, but executive orders on tariffs and all these things are like active negative actions. The executive order that prevents nuclear deployments is an executive order that ties our hands, shows restraint. And so the, the, the whole point is how do you credibly signal something to North Korea? Credible signaling involves, has to involve costs. You have to have a dramatic sunk cost or you have to tie your hands in some way. And so I'm trying to cleverly use the authorities that exist to tie our hands in a way that convinces North Korea that like we're not just gonna destroy them overnight, right? Or that we're not gonna bomb them. Um, because when we say we won't do it, they don't believe us and they have no reason to believe us. But when we issue something that has the force of law that says only the president will decide if a B-52 goes to Korea, that has power. That's a credible signal. Um, anyway, when I was a graduate student at the University of Maryland, from which he graduated, <laughs> one of my teachers was Oren Young. And I, oh. I took his you know, seminar on the negotiation. He taught a negotiation. He focused mostly on environmental negotiations. But he coined the term proactive bargaining. And he told me the strong always give concession first. There is the best way of facilitating negotiation. And I think that in your presentation, you know, echoes me of my old teaching from my old teacher about proactive bargaining. Let us give a bigger power to the 